tinka 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 Hey guys, Scott from Aristocob.com here. Seth from all over the place. Hello there! How the heck y'all doing? Jay, also known as D-I-G-H-S-X from YouTube.com. <laughs> and together, the four of us it turns out this time, uh, we are Markwood Men's Breakfast Club. Good morning. Good, good morning, boy. Good morning. Good morning, Jay. Good morning. Who's, who's the fourth person? You. Uh, the folks watching the video. Oh, the- no, I never got that. <laughs> Viewers like you. You've always been the third guy, Jay. Oh, I didn't realize that. I wasn't thinking that way. Gosh, well, <coughs> for everybody else who's just now uh, picking up on that, it's been you all along. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody said I was smart. So and I'm wondering, is this? Are we getting like a loop of of the microphone recording? We might be Jay talking. We might be. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we're trying something new for the very first time, which is kind of the definition of new. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this conversation is inspired by the uh, Shop Time Throwdown that uh, Jay and I have just completed, and that hopefully you're in the process of judging. So uh, we thought we got to get together and talk about our projects a little bit. And uh, I don't know, maybe people would be interested in it. And if not, we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that how it always goes? Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. We're going to put... Uh, we see the see the analytics where the viewership just goes whop after about 10 seconds. we got to put annotations in the description <laughs> so they know how to get to skip to the good stuff. We could do that. All right. Well, that's, that's assuming there is good stuff. <laughs> That's always the assumption, isn't it? So anyway, uh, yeah, we just finished these clocks, and uh, that was a lot of fun. I don't know what you thought about that, Jay, but I, I enjoyed the excuse to get into my shop for a change. Yeah, I just wish I had had more time to actually be in my shop. Yeah. But, but, but the mental challenge was fun. Uh, really, okay, good, good point. So, Boy is going to be our moderator. He has some questions for us, and he can go off script anytime. But and just, I will, but you won't know because you don't know what the script looks like. Actually, he kind of does. I wasn't talking to him. I was talking to the fourth person. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The proverbial you. Yeah. <laughs> And and we were corrected. We do have a female viewer. We we have a <laughs> female viewer. That's correct. Yeah, we, we were noticing that our analytics show us that there are zero women watching. And we had a, a, actually a couple of them that yeah. said, well, I'm watching. So uh, Google Analytics are not accurate or they need to go check their profile. <laughs> <laughs> so get us started off here, boy. Ask a question of something that you care to hear about. Um, what? prompted the throwdown well i guess before that uh we should allow jay opportunity to introduce himself oh yeah for anyone (laughs) well i mean what for anybody new to youtube yeah yeah (laughs) or or we should probably introduce ourselves for the benefit of his thousands and thousands and millions of viewers that's true jay tell us about yourself uh youtube videos (laughs) do you yeah i don't i don't know how i would introduce myself how would you introduce me? Um, even better question. That's okay. So we'll, we'll introduce you, and then you can introduce us. So <clears throat> Jay is, um, you know what? You are one of my favorite storytellers. Um, I, I love. I remember some of the very first videos I ever watched of you. You came on my radar somehow, and as I looked at all your videos, I, I'm thinking to myself, "Oh, what a mistake this guy's making! Twenty minute long videos? That's nuts." <clears throat> And then I watched a couple of them, and I think I've watched every one of them now. So um, here on YouTube, uh, Jay is a, a beloved, um, what do I want to say? A, um, wizard? We'll go with wizard. <laughs> <laughs> Wizards can be beloved. <laughs> now you're, I would say personality. I would say I would say personality. Yeah. Well, you you reach beyond the pipe community, but you, that's certainly I think where you, where you're anchored is in yeah. the pipe community. But uh, anyway, uh, you're, I would imagine that some of your uh, projects around your house and some of the projects in your shop have also drawn people in. You know, uh, yeah. we we all watched you working on. Was that a side entryway that you were putting? Yeah. yeah. Putting all kinds of stuff on. I mean. Uh, 
in, in, in gardening and hydroponics and killing uh, insects. <laughs> you do it all. Sign making. Yeah. I don't know. I just kind of film whatever I find interesting. You know, that's, that's my thing. And I remember when I first started, and not to derail this, but I first started making videos kind of for the pipe community. And there were people that were like, oh, why are you talking about stuff other than pipes? And it's like, yeah, you got to talk about something. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and now it seems like everybody's talking about stuff other than pipes. <laughs> hey, let's have a contest. Yeah, which is a good thing. I'm not saying it like it's bad. It's you, uh, okay, uh, I think may maybe we share similar opinions on the contest thing because I love the idea that it gives people who otherwise don't have something to talk about, hey, I can get in front of my camera and I can talk and I'm going to participate in the contest and then I'm also going to share what's on my mind. So yeah. that's wonderful. But yeah, I think a great entry point. your comment about the, the, the 10 questions, I think, is yeah. what makes me think of this, where you did your 10 questions video, and then the next thing you know, everybody's asking 10 questions, and they were also similar. Yeah, so you end up having 100 questions, and it's like, hey, right. <laughs> this year I should do a 10 questions video. Hmm. I enjoy those. That's a great idea. <laughs> anyway, sorry, we're already getting off track. No, uh, so uh, introduce me, Jay. <laughs> Uh, that is uh, Scott, a.k.a. Aristocop, a.k.a. Mr. Tool Hunter, a.k.a. co-host of our good men's breakfast club. And uh, that's his boy, Seth, <laughs> who is co-host of our good men's breakfast club. And uh, I would say you are two of the... Largest? But, uh, no, I was going to say notorious <laughs> characters. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know if that would come off the wrong way. Uh, your Mark with Glenn Breakfast Club thing is actually more of just like kind of a nice conversation about you generally have a purpose, but it doesn't always end up that way. <laughs> 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 and I think I first saw you, Scott, on the Aristocop channel, which you also have, Aristocop.com, for all your corn cop pipe needs. Uh, <laughs> plug for you. And, Thank you. Uh, I saw you on there, and I think Seth, I saw you on another channel. You were maybe something on another channel. I thought he's had a couple channels now. Yeah, maybe uh, when I was doing P ninety X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That crashed and burned hard. <laughs> <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> You know, we were just talking about uh, taking a strengths test, and, and, and we realized that um, Seth is really, really good at starting things. Yeah. And there you go. <laughs> I, th I thought you meant a physical strengths, and I wouldn't be really good if I had continued with the P90X, but as it is, I'm pretty weak. Yeah, if you want, if, if you're helping a friend move a piano and you're going downstairs, Seth is definitely the guy you want below, below the piano. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's really, that's us. So there, there's the intro uh, in here on YouTube. I got a couple channels only because I have some diverse interest and in not everything would would fit together or dovetail together well. So uh, it's funny that we're talking here on Markwood Men's Breakfast Club about what went on on another channel, which was the Mr. Tool Hunter, but yet the channel that I have the most subscribers and am most active on, 500 and some videos now, is actually Aristocop. So go figure. And, and not a single video on Wood Wishes. <laughs> what? <laughs> Dropped the ball. This would have been a perfect wood wish. I know. What's your wood wish? A big a clock. Clock. <laughs> clock that's this bit. I said clock. I said, that's my wood wish. <laughs> perfect segue, son. Tell us. Uh, ask us a question now. <clears throat> so speaking of speaking of, of wood wishes and uh, and clocks, how did the throwdown come about? What prompted that? This, this, uh, this is like a. I'm having a deja vu moment here. Yeah. Well, because I asked this and then I changed my mind. I can do that. I'm moderator to answer the well, question. Okay. I want to, I want to hear your answer to that, Jay, because I, I think I've expressed this already. Uh, I would say that uh, I had kind of gone MIA on YouTube for a little bit. And uh, you reached out to me to see if I was doing all right. And we started talking. And uh, I think to get me out of my hole I was in, uh, you issued a challenge to get me moving. And uh, it was a very nice gesture of you. And I think also it was probably to get a little bit more viewership on your Mr. Tool Hunter. But I think at the core of it, it was more just to help me, which was a hell of a nice thing you did. And, and it got me going. And it got me posting videos again. It got me moving. Good. So, 
that really it was it was less about the getting my other channel because I I've, I've actually wanted to do some videos on the Mr. Tool Hunter channel and just my problem of getting things started nothing was ever right you know the space was never right and the lighting's not right and you know the, the, I think the key to all this is just do it you know yeah. just have to do it yeah that's really how how it started though is that. <clears throat> Actually, Jay Jay responded to a, an I think it was an email or a text or something, and he shared some things that I just couldn't reply to in a text. And so I said, "Hey, we never talked on the phone." I said, "Jay, what's your phone number? Can I call you?" And we just got to talking about it. And one of and one of my questions of any woodworker who's needing to get out of a hole, as you say, is so are you spending any time in the shop? Because the shop is really sawdust therapy to guys like us. And when you said no, I said, we need to do something. And then I think I think I just thought about it at night and I, and I realized that we could do a little competition between us. And I wasn't getting enough time in my shop either. Yeah. And I uh, just needed to have that fire lit underneath me. So it yeah. helped me too. And I think it's funny that he revealed after the clock challenge that he used to be a horologist. Now, wait a second. <laughs> I, I, I can go back to my emails and see who suggested a clock. I believe it was you. But yeah, maybe. But <laughs> <laughs> you kept that little detail. In, and actually, if I'm being completely honest, I think I sort of do that. But I'm dumb enough to take the challenge. <laughs> You know, I'd, I'd never built, at least on that scale, for sure, never made a clock. I've made clocks where you drill a hole and you stick a quartz movement through the hole, right? But I'd, yeah. And I've made every part of a clock in doing clock repair, but I'd never made a clock before. Mm -hmm. And and this one was just so different that it made it interesting, too. So, yeah. you know, I, I don't know that I had an, an advantage over you. It's for yeah. sure. So I, I, I'm, I'll blindly go into anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my advantage. <laughs> Again, yeah, the trick is to do it. Or at least start it, right? I, I don't I don't know that you can guarantee that you're gonna do it, but you know, no. you're not gonna do it for sure if you don't start. Yeah, exactly. So anyway. All right. Another question, boy. Uh, tell us about your shop. What is it? What's it look like? What kind of shop you got? And uh, in particular, what tools did you use in the build? And I know you guys described some of those during some of your videos, but um, you know, tell us about the shop. Gord Edge. It's a four car garage that was never intended for cars. The guy I bought the house from uh, welded, he did like pipeline hmm. welding. And so he set up a welding shop out there. It's uh, hmm. like 16 foot ceilings and a second floor. And it's, I think, 30 by 40, double insulated. My gosh. Yeah, it's, uh, when I saw that, I'm like, I don't even need to see the house. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've seen the stairs behind you in some of the videos. So what's upstairs? Uh, I got a couch, and I think I filmed a couple of videos up there. But uh, huh. it's it's like a little, what he intended it to be originally was when his buddies would come up north, they could all stay up there instead of staying in the house and annoying his wife. And okay. then they realized that they he had beer on tap in the house, so that never worked out <laughs> <up there. laughs> So. But I've got, you know, a couch and a TV and stuff up there, but nice. I don't go up there, to be honest with you. So, but what tools do you have then in your shop? Uh, not enough. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Pretty standard answer. I mean, I've got a table saw, a drill press, a machine, a metal lathe, I mean, all the standard kind of stuff, a CNC machine. I've got a giant dust collector. Which... Uh, all, wait, wait. Standard kind of stuff does not include a CNC machine. <laughs> In my shop, it's standard. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I got the CNC, and then I've got a huge uh, dust collector, because at my old house, the shop was in the basement, and when you CNC, uh, like MDF, mm. it creates a real super fine dust, and so the boss was like, something has to change, so I went out and used that as an excuse to buy a giant grizzly vacuum <laughs> thing, and uh, so now I've got that, which is really nice. Is that one of those, like, 2 micron or 0.5 micron? Yeah, yeah, it's a two-stage cyclone thing. Yeah, it takes its own circuit, runs off 220. It's pretty sweet. I had a five-horse grizzly dust collector one time. I, I, I got it in a trade with a guy for something else, and um, that thing was so loud I couldn't run it, and it ended up selling it for even more. It was, it was like a like a game of, uh, what was that, the guy that started with a paperclip and ended up with a house or something? Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot like that. So. 
<clears throat> well, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get back to the CNC because I, okay. I want to know more about that. But I'll tell you, in my shop, or at least uh, what I used mostly for this build was a bunch of ShopSmith equipment. I used to work for ShopSmith and was a trainer for them, and I love their tools. And what's funny is I've got. Um, I've got full-size industrial equipment. I've got a Powermatic 66 table saw. I got a Delta 14-inch bandsaw, uh, Delta planer, uh, excuse me, Powermatic pl- porter cable. What am I trying to say? God bless you. I don't know. It'd be a DeWalt planer <laughs> and a Delta jointer. But whenever I need to do something accurately, whenever I need something that, you know, for me, I need kind of some, some intimacy with the tool. Um, I absolutely am standing at my shopsmith. You know, a smaller table on the table saw that a lot of folks criticize. If it's the only table you have, then maybe you would complain about it. But most of the things I'm doing on that saw are not huge. Um, You know, if I'm working with two by fours or sheet goods, that stuff is cut to size long before it makes its way over to the saw. And uh, so anyway, mostly shopsmith equipment. Shopsmith, Planer bandsaw. I do have a fantastic uh, Bosch chop saw that I use that quite a bit. And then um, maybe you you saw the video that I did where I used a Harbor Freight planer where I took the blades out of it and I used that as a stock feeder and I ran boards underneath a wire brush. I've used that before for uh, for making molding. I have a kind of an an overhead router that I mount to it that the stock runs underneath that router and I can machine boards with that so that's that's really the tools that I used for my build cool I just used a CNC machine (laughs) so so, uh, some abrasives as well Jay did you sand anything (laughs) She had the CNC machine okay. to... I have the portable drill down the state. That's all I have. The wall, like, tiny little battery drill. And some carriage bolts. Uh, I used a torch. <laughs> a lot more than I've ever used on a woodworking project, I'll tell you that. That was bizarre. Normally wood and fire don't go that well together. Yeah, they got along great, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> So, CNC machine. Yeah. Uh, why is that sta- a standard tool in your shop? Because I have to overcomplicate everything I do. Okay. Well, it, it, explain explain what the CNC is for anyone that may not know. Just it's a computer numerically controlled machine. So what this is is basically a router mounted on a machine that can move it in three axes. So you've got X, Y, and Z up and down. And so uh, you can then write a program that then moves it to cut out shapes or carve or whatever you want it to do. And you can change the bits you have to do different profiles. So like that. stepping back a router, for anybody who doesn't know what that is, is, is like a high-speed drill where the cutters not only cut on the tip like a drill bit but also on their sides so that's how you were able to all cut around yeah all yeah. the way around that's how you were able to cut those gear teeth out yeah or wheels the teeth on the wheels seth so as horologists like to call them so so what i hear you say is you aren't doing so much woodworking as much as computer coding <laughs> Well, there was wood involved. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. The, Fair enough. the results are what this was all about. Sure. Right. Yeah. And not always the case. Well, I mean, we, we could have said in this throwdown, it must incorporate the <laughs> use of a lathe. It must incorporate this and that, which may be the next one, Jay. <laughs> How are you on a lathe? Uh, I don't know. Good. Fine. You should you you guys should swap. He has to use the shopsmith. You have to use, <laughs> use the CNC, CNC. <laughs> and, and see what see what comes out. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, I the CNC. I got into that. Uh, well, I started off my career, professional career, programming uh, PLCs or programmable logic controllers. It was all like conveyor systems and robots and stuff, and. Uh, I always had done woodworking all my life. My grandfather was into it, and he kind of, you know, how that always goes. He pulls you under his wing and all that kind of stuff. And so when I became an adult with 
disposable income. <laughs> uh, I was doing woodworking and there was stuff I wanted to do that I couldn't get precise enough. And wood is kind of finicky anyway. Right. You know, you get a really good hardwood, you can be, you know, really, really precise. And I couldn't get it, the results I wanted, so I thought, well, why not overcomplicate this hobby and bring a computer into it? And so then I built my first CNC machine, which just had like an 18 by probably 14 cutting area. And then I built, you know, that's not very big, although that machine was very, very precise. Uh, then I built this one, which is a two foot by four foot cutting area, which opens up, you know, a quarter sheet of plywood. Hmm. So you can really start doing a lot of different stuff with it, you know, on a bigger scale. And then I had a buddy who saw mine and really liked it. So then I built a third machine, which I then took my machine and made improvements on that and then built that for him. Did you use your CNC machine to build your next CNC <laughs> machine? Yeah, yeah. I used it to create one of itself. Which Isn't is kind of cool. That is really cool. Yeah. 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 Is it mostly wood? I mean, the structure? Yeah, it's MDF. That's an amazing material. Yeah, yeah. And I, I seal it, you know, so it won't moisture won't affect it. But it, huh. it's a shockingly stable. Yeah. But the only thing that was really tricky about building this CNC machine, the one I used for this project, was on my first CNC machine, I bought a, uh, how do I say this, it, like a, a controller for it, pre-made. Mm. You then hook the computer to that, and then it drives the motors to move the router around. On this one, I built the power supply and controller from scratch. But to move something that you know can cut a two by four area is really heavy, so you have to use really big stepper motors are the motors that actually move it around hmm. so you need a lot of power so it's something like i think 54 volts dc at like 40 amps and you're getting into power that can kill you pretty quick hmm. and so it's you have to really watch what you're doing like the capacitor this might be getting way too technical but the capacitor that smooths out the dc current is actually the size of a coke can because it has to be that big to handle hmm. that much power going through it and when and, and when touching the capacitor you you lick your fingers and. <laughs> yeah, if you put a screwdriver across the two leads, it would weld it to it. Amazing. Wow. I actually put a bleeder resistor across the capacitor so when you turn it off, it dissipates the power in it. Because if you don't, there have been a lot of guys who don't do that and then they're monking around with their power supply and hit that and they get, you know, 40 amps. Amazing. How many ohms? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not telling you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'd, I think I would love to have a CNC machine, but then I know what comes with it is the challenges of having to learn how to do the programming that drives it. And yeah, and that's not too bad. Either. I mean, like I use some software that has like a graphical interface, and it's it's not too bad to do. You can import like an AutoCAD file, and then you know figure out all your toolpath stuff. But it, it's not like insurmountable. That's not something that would really stop you. Hmm. The, the problem I think that maybe somebody like you would have. Is now you've got a computer in the shop. Yeah. Kind of just the shop. You know what I mean? Like the computer I have in the shop, I don't have on the internet because I just I don't want to open that window while I'm out there. You know what I mean? <laughs> yep. Yep. I can see that happening being, being a problem. Yeah. So maybe we we need to have a uh, win a trip to Jay's CNC school competition. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'd be the guy to give that class. <laughs> It could be fun. Well, to me, that was the, the, probably the most fascinating part of your build was the fact that you did this on your CNC, that you built yourself, and that you you designed all those gears yourself and that you even had any idea where to start with that process. So I'm going to jump in and ask you a question. How did you start? I mean, how did you figure out... You know, how to build that thing? And, and I don't... You mean the CNC machine? No, I'm talking about your clock now. Your clock. How did you... What's funny is my wife was asking me about this. She's like, how did you figure it out? Yeah. And, and, and I don't want this to sound weird, but to me, it wasn't that hard. Because if you think about it, you've got, you know, like the minute hand. That's a gear that's going to go around once an hour. You've got right. an hour hand. It's going to go around once every 12 hours. So you got a 12 to 1 gear ratio. And then you just start working backwards. And so... If you, if you, you know, what I started thinking about was like a grandfather clock, mm -hmm. pendulum going back and forth. And so then what I couldn't figure out was, does it advance the driving gear on just the tick or both on the tick at the top? And so then what I decided is, well, I'll just have mine advance every you know, once a second. And so then I thought, okay. And so then I just, you just work out the math. I mean, 
it was it's not really that complicated in some ways, at least to me. And I don't, I don't want that to sound boastful, but it just seemed like, okay, I know what my gear ratios need to be. And then when I screwed up and left all my calculations <laughs> downstate, I came up here and I started getting other numbers. What I noticed was that there are set ratios that are almost seem predetermined, yeah. no matter what your gear sizes are. And then when I talked to you about it, you sent me a picture out of a book that showed those ratios that I had kind of noticed in monkeying around. Hmm. Now, I will say that I cheated. I don't think you caught it. How I cheated is, since I'm using a stepper and a computer controlled uh, motor to drive this, you can make it really whatever you want. I have what you would probably in the clock world would be considered an infinitely variable pendulum time. Sure. An infinitely variable gear on there. Even though it has 10, ge- 10 teeth on it, it's infinitely variable, where in a normal clock you wouldn't have that. So for my clock, the gears that drive my minute hand could be anything. They, I could have 100 gears of all random sizes, and then I can adjust the program that controls it to spin at the rate to make sure that that goes around hmm. once an hour. The only ratio that matters is the 12 to 1. Now, I will say, in my ignorance or my defense, I didn't discover that until I started building it. Hmm. And then I put it all together, and I realized these gears in front of this make no difference. Sure. I can program it to do whatever I want. So you're like, I can't lose. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I can make this at a perfect time. <laughs> A exactly. digital clock ratio right i'm good to go so but but it wasn't just you know a motor you had something that told that motor how far to rotate and how yeah. frequently can you explain that if you go back from the motor i have a stepper driver a little board for that and then that's being controlled by an arduino that i program to run the stepper driver which then sends the signals to the motor to run what is that I, I know that I know that some of the nerds uh, got excited about that when you first announced it. Logic, little programmable logic controller is what it is, and so you can write a program into that. It's a very it's tiny computer and stuff like that to to run other things or to make other things happen. And, and really, that that part of it, since I've done so much of that, I've never really used Arduino before this. That literally was like three minutes to write the program. <laughs> I mean, it was it was nothing. Wow. Part of it. So, at what point in the build did you decide to rewrite time so that the second hand should take 24 minutes? <laughs> well, it's because <laughs> when, I, when I calculated things when I was out of town, I used an 8 tooth gear. And when I calculated things here, I used a 10 I didn't realize I had that was the difference. So I ended up cutting extra gears. So when I had two extra gears, I thought, well, I'll drive them off of another gear, and that could be a second hand. But the only problem with that is it'll take 24 minutes for the second hand to go around, which I really should have probably put a chopstick on there for a hand, just because it's funny. But it's really, it's really confusing. So yeah. that was, you know, I had extra parts, and like I usually do. I, I, I got a kick out of that. I thought that was real funny. <laughs> it really brings up something that me and Scott talked about during the build is, you, you know, after I started doing all this math in my head, you realize how arbitrary the interval of time is. I mean, 24 hours kind of makes sense because, you know, the Earth spins in right. that interval. But why you divide it up to 24, why you divide it in 60. And you can translate some of that back to nautical stuff, like, you know, a nautical mile and an Sure. And all that. But really, it, it could be anything. And it's kind of interesting when you stop and think about it. Yeah. There there have been pushes for metric time. <coughs> you know, all right? Yeah. Metric time. It's dying. Um, and it, it absolutely could work. If everybody would just stop and throw their watches and clocks away, you could divide it, uh, uh, the rotation of the Earth into any number of divisions you want. To Ten. Yeah. And and as a computer programmer, do not do that because that is going to be a giant update. <laughs> be like the Y2K <laughs> bug, huh? <laughs> <laughs> were, say it's bad enough. were you a part of that? Were you involved in the whole Y2K? Uh, yeah, I, I basically told everybody they're crazy. But yeah. Did you fill your bathtub, though? <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> I didn't either. The thing about that, not to really derail this, the thing about that that I found funny, there was some code that needed to be updated, yes. But there were people like, you know, planes are going to drop out of the sky, you know, power grid's going to go down. If people realized how cobbled together all these systems work <laughs> it could go down right now I wait for Y2K it could just at any random moment just crash so why why that you know what I mean that's true well at, at this very moment uh, parts of Washington D.C. are pitch black so you know 
that, that that was probably somebody plugging a toaster in at the same time they were using an iron. Who knows? If you find, if you find anybody who works like at networking or any kind of big system, and you say, "How stable do you think that is?" If they really are in it, they'll be like, "Oh man, I can't believe this." <laughs> Everybody you talk to is like, you know, just this is hanging by a thread, and you know, and that's how it all is. It's just cop together. That's funny and scary. Yeah. <laughs> off topic a bit. I liked it. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> yeah. What else, boy? Uh, what inspired your clock? Oh. What was the inspiration? Yeah. Start with you. With me? Yeah. Um, all right. I knew I wanted to build a big clock. I knew that from the start, that uh, I wanted a very large clock in my shop. And that goes back to where I repaired or worked on... I was a part of a team of three that worked on a tower clock. Um, I used to buy parts from a guy who used to be, uh, used to have a clock shop in uh, Chicago and his, I think it was his wife's family passed away, left them a farm in Ohio. And he decided, you know what? He wanted to be a gentleman farmer. So he moved to Ohio, sold his business to his partner, but he kept a wholesale clock parts business that he ran out of his barn. So I I just was close enough that I could stop in and buy things from him. Everybody else that bought from him bought through the mail back in those days. Mm -hmm. And um, you'd you'd walk in past his uh, combine and his tractors and into a back room, and then there was where all these, these parts were. And I bet most of his customers would have flipped out to know where <laughs> where their clocks <laughs> clock parts were being kept anyway the one part of the clock business he re- remained in as far as the repair work is he was a tower clock repairman and so like one one weekend a month he would be off jetting off to some place to repair a tower clock and i remember telling him that if you were ever anywhere within 100 miles of dayton let me know i would love to just carry your tool bag and uh Lo and behold, he gives me a call one day, <clears throat> says that a guy had contracted with the city of Lebanon, Ohio, to repair the tower clock in the uh, city hall. And when he got up in there, he realized that he probably should never have <laughs> never have gotten into the contract. He tracked down this gentleman that I'm talking about, who then called me. So the three of us were up there. I was carrying tool bags and uh, just there as muscle to help these guys you know, move parts around and carry things up and down ladders and stairwells and things. But it was such a fun experience for me, and I, and I did help them solve one problem that they were scratching their heads about, and that made me feel really good about my involvement. So ever since then, I've wanted a big clock, and when we talked about doing this, that's what I wanted to do. That was my inspiration for making a big clock. And then from there... The mother of invention, the necessity, was the fact that I couldn't find a movement that could handle the hands of a clock as big as I wanted to build. And in, in, in my shop, when I leave my shop when I'm there, I throw a breaker, a main breaker that shuts all the power off. So if I'm going to power this clock, it's got to be battery powered. It can't be powered by you know the grid. So I had to come up with a solution that would drive those big hands. So there's how mine got started. Cool. How about you, Jay? I thought anybody can buy a clock movement and stick it in the box. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in my constant quest to call overcomplicate my life, I thought I'll try reverse engineering a clock. And that was really where mine started from. <laughs> having a CNC machine that, you know, you can make gears. And I have made gears before. I made a rope making machine once. But I overcomplicated that instead of using. I don't know how much you know about rope making machines, but you know it would be three strands, right? And then they spin it on an axis. What I did was I put three sets of three, so you get like a triple blade. But it was this whole mechanical gizmo that would spin everything around. You could turn it with one hand. So I had done a little gear stuff before, but. All right, let's make let's cross a rope making machine off of yeah, the, the next, next throwdown. <laughs> Wow, that's cool. But had you ever wanted to build a, a wooden geared clock? Is that? Uh, I think a few times I had thought about it. Yeah. You know, I'd seen some stuff on the web and everything, but that's one of those projects you just never quite get to. Hold on, boy's poking at me here. Oh, pen. Um, I've always wanted to build a wooden geared clock, and if I had had the time to do it, that absolutely would have been 
my preferred build. But the other issue that I had is, I, I think I've mentioned too, my shop is cold in winter, it's hot in the summer. I got spiders and bugs and all kinds of stuff because windows have to be open mm-hmm. in the summertime, which is actually gonna- Birds, fact, we get birds. We get birds. Uh, the, the, the open windows, I think, will factor into the, um, the accuracy of my clock. I have no question about that. Or who knows, if a spider builds a nest on one of my clock hands, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or every you know every uh, uh, six hours, suddenly the spider goes, whoa, there it is again. <laughs> so your clock, let's talk about your clock for a minute. So you have this arm that's perfectly balanced. Yeah. And then inside the counterbalance, you have a clock movement. Yes. And then inside of that, you have like, say, take the minute hand. You have the minute hand arm with a weight attached to the arm. All right, let's take a minute hand. <laughs> I actually stopped by my shop and grabbed the minute hand because there's another secret I haven't shared. I, mean, I, I shared it, but then again, I didn't share it. Look at it; it's it's wanting to it's wanting to level out right now. I showed the hour hand only because it's a little bit less complicated. The minute hand you can see is hollowed out, and there's some uh, some metal pieces. I, I glued some washers with hot melt hot melt glue. And that's to give me a place to stick some rare earth magnets. How'd you hollow that out? Uh, a Forstner bit. Oh, Actually, you multiple. Need you, you need to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. <coughs> um, I had a couple problems, Jay, and, and this is all a problem with me and planning. <clears throat> I had this figured out because the thickness of the clock movement. Let me, let me pop off the back here. Oh, that's the wrong end. This is this is the side that has the uh, the counterbalance in it, and that counterbalance is made from an electrical outlet cover. The corner of one, you can even see the hole where maybe you can see it, the hole where you could affix that to a, an outlet, and then I have uh, soldered onto that a a nut. Now originally I had soldered onto those, and I grabbed this while I was in the shop. Ugh. A key, all right. Yeah. This is a key like you'd put in a, in a motor in a, in a keyway on a shaft, and this is about I don't know three eighths inch square, super duper heavy. I took the time to make two of these, cutting a saw kerf into that with a hacksaw, and then soldering that little metal plate down into it. Stuck it on my clock, and my high torque hands or high torque clock movement couldn't move them, wouldn't move them at all. Uh, so I had to start over. And in fact, I brought along these are the hands that I purchased that are designed to be on that movement, right? And I think I mentioned that these are designed to be on an 18 inch diameter clock. And these are just super duper thin, super light. I guess they're aluminum. And uh, so my counterbalance was overwhelming the uh, clock movement. The other thing I have going on in here, well, so I glued this piece of plywood it's a little bit off center inside of this tobacco tin uh, because I wanted to have room for the thickness of the clock movement. So I knew once I glued that on that this tin had to be glued onto the arm in a certain orientation. So the first one I glued on with a hot melt polyurethane adhesive, I realized, crap, I glued it on backwards. All right, so I screwed one of them up I will not make that mistake again, and then I immediately made that mistake exactly again, even thinking very thoroughly about it. So on this end, you can see I've got two covers, okay? Because it's, it's okay, guys. The minute handle will do one rotation every 24 minutes. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so I had to cut this out of the uh, the the what would have been the original cover to make room for the fact that the movement sticks proud, all right? And what's inside of this one, because this hand is so stinking long, is I've got a whole bunch of nuts glued in there to to give more weight to this counterbalance. Now, just moving this hand around has moved this counterbalance, all right? So when, when this thing is in place, the weight is always, always, always hanging straight down. 
okay? So no matter where the hand is, that weight will be hanging straight down. And so basically, the weight is acting as kind of an anchor that the movement is climbing up and over, right? And as it moves, the counterbalance swings. But you're swinging the center of gravity. Exactly right. Yep. That's it. So anyway, that's, uh, cool. that's how it works. And, and the way I balanced all this is on the back side of this hand, I don't know if you can see it, but I, I made a saw cut. Can you see a little kerf? Yeah. And I had a little, uh, a little, basically a blade mounted on a block that I put this on, and then I was able to balance it just in one direction, right? It may be out of balance a little bit this way, but in this direction, I was able to get it all balanced using these weights. Oh, I had weights glued over here too, and then I put the cover caps on, and they added weight that I'd forgotten to factor in, so. <laughs> Yeah, it's always something. That's for version two. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I got a buddy who says you should make every project three times. The first one you make all your mistakes. The second one you kind of get it all figured out and get all your jigs and fixtures right. And then the third one you're sick of making it. <laughs> Is that what happened with the CNC machine? No, that's always fun. <laughs> now, when are you going to use the CNC to build a 3D printer? Is that the next step? 3D printing, but it's 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 awful slow, and it's just not it's not me. Yeah. You know, I like wood. Although I hate wood for CNC, I like wood. Because <laughs> dimensionally, wood, like especially plywood, is very stable. It's really annoying. Yeah. So speaking of that, speaking of wood, right? Here's one of the slats that I made my dial from. I cut several of them because I knew that would happen. Oh. Yeah, can you see? Yeah. Can you see <laughs> that? Uh, they are so bowed and cupped and twisted, and this is a crook for those of you who are not woodworkers. When a, you look at the face of a board that makes a bend like that, that's called a crook, and a, and a, a cup would go this way, and a bow would go this way, and I and in a twist, and I have every one of those conditions in my pieces. So hmm. that was fun to deal with. That would be annoying. <laughs> so I shared with Jay something that was interesting that I discovered only after I, I got this thing finished is I was looking for an article that I wanted to add to my video, right? And I ended up finding that article and posting it. Um, and I stumbled across this article from 1909, American Machinist, that shows, uh, maybe I can't show that. It shows my clock, basically. Look at that, boy. It shows the counterbalance and uh, talks about having the hands perfectly balanced. And uh, I sent this to Jay to show for him to see it, and I should, I'll, I guess, I'll put a link to it so you guys can find it. It was a Google um, Google Book scan, and it is a full, I guess, maybe a year's publication of a monthly, bi-monthly publication, and. Um, Somebody shared this story right here, boy, about a clock like mine, and then didn't explain how it worked. And then for months after month after month, people were writing in saying, here's how I think it works. And uh, it's kind of cool. I'll, I'll share that somehow. They call it a peculiar clock. It is peculiar. Yeah, I agree with that. But I think that this was based on the clock that was written in 19, I'm sorry, 1895, which is the, the one that I based mine on, at least the idea of it. Again, they didn't share how to do it either. So... It says here the minute hand rotates once every 37 minutes. <laughs> so that, that is peculiar. 37, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you funny man. Yeah. So, <clears throat> wait, you mentioned that that dad had a, a bit of a head start, um, a, a bit of a cheat background in clocks. How did you get into clock repair or horology? Me? You. I was hoping to hear Jay talk about that. Well, Jay, tell me about your history with horology. <laughs> about a month ago, some guy told me to build a clock. Oh. It's <laughs> an interesting history. <laughs> um, uh, okay, going back as far as I can remember, and literally my first memory that I can recall 
is going with my grandfather, my mom's dad, to the railroad station that he used to work in. He was an engineer, not a not a riding on the train kind of an engineer, but a, an engineer that worked in the, the machinist shop. And I remember going into his boss's office and being just mesmerized by this giant regulator clock that was on the wall. What's a regulator clock, he said? Uh, regulator clocks are clocks that are kind of like grandfather clocks. I guess that's sort of the evolution is the grandfather clock is what exist in most people's homes that would be similar but a a clock with a very long pendulum about a meter long so it ticks once per second but hung on a wall and these were found in railroad stations because they had to keep time Mm -hmm. and the the folks running the train would set their watches by these and you know that's part of how you keep your clock your uh, your trains running on time and then of course came the uh, the telegraph which help everybody kind of coordinate time as well but that was my earliest memories was seeing this clock in this guy's office and then being mesmerized by it then years later as a young man i went to an antique store in waynesville ohio the antique capital of the midwest and i fell in love with this clock that they had and it i asked the guy how much it was he says that that clock um it's missing most of the movement and the veneer's falling off of it and it's missing the dial and the weights aren't there and there's no there's no pendulum 10 bucks <laughs> this was 1981 and i bought it and then my next visit i was selling batteries to retail stores at the time that was my job i went into um davidson's jewelry in lebanon ohio right almost catty corner from the clock i eventually worked in this is funny how that all comes together and i went in and the uh, the manager of that place was john davidson not the john davidson but john davidson davidson and i brought the clock in to show him and he's like dude you're nuts you know you'd be perfect to go to the school that i went to to learn how to, to do jewelry And almost a year to the day, I found myself in Quincy, Illinois, going to Gem City College School of Horology. And I went to school to learn how to repair clocks and uh, did that full time for about five years before I realized that my personality was great at getting business in to my shop, but not so good at getting business out of my shop. Um, I, I wasn't good at being alone and sitting at my bench and being productive. I could do all the things I needed to do. I had the skills and the knowledge. I just didn't have the interest to do that. And, you know, sit at a bench facing a wall all day is what you know clockmakers do. But that, that's where it came from. Kind that of a, sounds like a fantastic job. Long story. Sitting at a bench staring at a wall? Yeah. Hey, j- at the end of the day, you can see something. That's true. You did something. Working computers at the end of the day, you just got nothing. Well, I think, unless you're working on your CNC, I think you would have you would have a similar experience to me, Jay. Though, because I ended up doing repair work, warranty repair work for a number of big, basically uh, furniture companies. Broyhill owned a, a clock line. Um, there was Sly. There was Ridgeway. Howard Miller. These were all big brands, most of them out of Michigan, actually. Yeah. And I was doing warranty repair work for them, and it was the same thing over and over and over and over. And that, that I only got excited when somebody called me and said, I have this clock, I've had it to two other shops, and they said it can't be fixed. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. That, that was all I needed. And, and then and then I would not do the 40 other clocks that came in ahead of that clock just so I could do that one. So yeah. not good business. <laughs> <laughs> I, I ended up having to sell all of my tools, though, because even though I told people that I was no longer repairing clocks, they still kept suckering me in with those those rare and exotic and complicated things. And uh, I finally, like I said, I had to sell all my equipment because... Uh, now I, say no. Now I'm to the point where I can't I can't repair your clock. I'm sorry, I don't have the equipment to do it. Where before I just couldn't say no. Yeah, you're right. That sounds like someone I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot like somebody you know. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> you you're guys, l- you're loud when you say that. I'm sorry. I, it's 
because I've lost my voice over the last few days, so I'm, I'm forcing it out. Yeah. Um, you guys been working on the clocks for what a month now? We started thinking about it a month ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Over that time, during the the clock preparation and planning and strategizing and and building process, how much tobacco did you consume? <laughs> Thank you for bringing that home. <laughs> Uh, one cigar, probably about four pipes, and probably two tins of snooze. Oh, wow. So not enough. <laughs> no. Not really. <laughs> um, I would say exactly uh, two tins of Sutliff. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no cigars, um, it, but yeah, about about two tins of Sutliff. I needed the tins, and therefore, <laughs> and just just so everyone knows, they are both they are both aromatic tins because I I can't uh, I can't stand the idea of passing any more time with uh, <laughs> with an English tobacco. So so you found a purpose for. Some of that that Sutliff tin. Oh yeah, tobacco. absolutely. <laughs> All right. So, uh, when smoking in the shop, what's your go-to shop tobacco? I mean, in this case, clearly Sutliff. Oh, Lane One Q is yeah, the, the go-to. Normal go-to for me. Whatever I left out there the last time. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, do you, do you typically smoke a pipe or a cigar when you're in your shop? Uh, it all depends what I'm doing. If I'm running the CNC machine, a cigar, because it's pretty hands off, and you can, you know, and you can kind of manage it. If I'm actually running tools, a pipe, yeah, kind of just varies. Yeah, I will occasionally, and I, I hadn't really thought about when it is I do that. I'll occasionally smoke a cigar in the shop. What what tools am I running when I do that? Because it's funny because I, I hadn't put that those two things together. But I bet I do. I bet I smoke a cigar when I'm when I'm doing a particular task. Yeah. But more times than not, it's a, it's a pipe. And I did it's find a magna cob. It's a magna cob. Yeah, absolutely. And I did find myself smoking too much and actually inhaling, which I don't do, um, because I was so intently focused on something and suddenly I realized wow my bowl is empty and my head is spinning <laughs> I should move away and, from the spinning blade that's right and I didn't remember that happening I, all I remembered was yeah. I just filled it lit it and then started resawing on the bandsaw yeah and and time just flew right by that's uh, if you mentioned like did you mention what kind of tools we enjoy no. using uh, because that so. to me um, I could live you know, shopsmith. No, besides besides that, if if Congress passed a law saying you could only have one one cutting tool, and who knows, this Congress could do that. No, they don't do anything. Um, thank you. For me, it'd be a bandsaw because I can make straight cuts, I can make curved cuts, I can do accurate. Uh, I, I can make uh, tenons and dovetails, and I can you know. Cut the thickest, tallest boards that I have with a bandsaw. You know what else can do most of those things? <laughs> Don't you say it. <laughs> Just saying. Hey, what's your go-to tool in the shop? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm a hand drill. <laughs> it's the, and it's the problem with having a CNC machine is once you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right. It's, then you start thinking about everything in that way, mm. you know, which is both good and bad. Well, I, I would I would see that you would you would look for projects that require um, uh, what what we refer to as vertical boring, right, yeah. where everything can be machined from one face. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, horizontal boring, getting into the edge of the board, not so common. And when you're working with sheet goods, you don't typically do that anyway. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, I work in my job. I work with a lot of people that that are very CNC driven and, and CNC centric, and uh, they're looking to buy connectors and hardware that's specifically used in in uh, uh, vertically board and vertically machined panels. You go to IKEA and those kind of you know 
uh, ready to assemble pieces of furniture are absolutely right right in the wheelhouse of, of the company I work for. So you need that ninety degree uh, Lego. Mm-hmm. Well, to yeah, and, two pieces, <laughs> and you're talking a material that otherwise. You couldn't join using traditional right. joinery methods. You can't cut a dovetail in the MDA. Well, you can cut it, but it doesn't do you any good. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, and, and, and running a screw into the end grain or the edge grain of, of particle board or MDF isn't going to do it for you either. So, yeah. So, anyway, yeah, we could talk about that for. Yeah, I, I pick up on that. Who's your buddy back there, Jay? Back where? Who's behind you? Other shoulder. Oh, that's Oscar. Oscar. Yeah. Yeah, that's Oscar. Hey, Oscar. He's like, whatever. (laughs) George is, where's George? He's over there sleeping. (laughs) All right, uh, two more questions. Where is, um, and you may have said in your videos, but uh, where is your clock going to find its home? Where's it going? Probably where all my other projects go in the closet. No, no, no. After I do them, I'm just not interested. You know, I'm not probably hanging up. It it needs to be behind you somewhere where you do videos. Don't you think? Where we could occasionally see it? Probably. Although I have another clock project in mind, so that might take over. Okay. What's going to be behind me? Mm. This kind of inspired me to think about clocks a little bit. Cool. All right. Well, that's great. Um, my clock is already <coughs> mounted on the wall, and since I couldn't put it up there myself, it's pretty much going to stay there. It's in the it's in the corner of my shop, one of the corners. Boy knows my shop has um, it's basically a barn, and the barn has two it's stories. Not basically, it is a barn. It's a barn. <laughs> it's uh, it's two stories, and then on to the back of that, there is an addition that is what I refer to as the bench room, the milking room. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Actually, my building was built uh, for a hosiery company that made socks back in the 1940s, and then it became a picture frame factory. Again, we're in High Point, North Carolina, which is the furniture, and at one time was the hosiery and textile capital of the mid of the of the U.S. Yeah. And then, after being a picture frame company, it became a, a cabinet shop in 1963, the year I was born. And until 1987, where the guy that started the clock shop in 63 shut his doors. And basically, he used the shop as a place to get away from his wife and tinker in the shop from 1987 till I stumbled across it in the, what, about the year 2007? Something sure. like that. 2007. Sounds about right. And so, uh, anyway, but back in the back of that space in the milking room, <laughs> that's the warm place. That's where the wood stove is. The space is smaller. Um, it's where the quiet work happens. There's no no real tools back in there. Where we film Mark Women's Breakfast Club. It is where we film our sh- our, our show, and that's where my clock is. It's, uh, it's back in that space. I can technically see it from the other room, but where I ultimately decided to put it is not where I originally was going to put it because it became too big for that space. So... So your shop isn't at your house? No, no. I rent a building. It uh, It's about a mile away from my house. And um, d- stumbled across it one day on my way to work and found out that it's owned by the stepdad of one of my co-workers. No. Oh. And um, it, it took three years of negotiating with the owner of the building and the guy that was renting the building, this gentleman that, you know, it was basically his hangout and convincing him that it would be in good hands. And ultimately, the thing that that won him over was I said, and I'd be happy to give you a key. You could come anytime you like. And uh, his equipment was all rusty and worn out. The roof had been leaking, and it just, it it wasn't a great place anymore, and it was on its way downhill. And uh, so he said with that, okay, sounds good. And I'd already talked three years earlier to the owner who said, look, the guy that's renting it, it's his until he wants out. Yeah. So we were able then to get the roof replaced and, and uh, do some work to, to kind of shore things up, and that's that's my space. 
but I don't I don't get enough time there. I don't I don't do anything professionally there. It's just for me to to tinker and get and, and hopefully do some things for the house. Trust me. My wife is expecting some things for the house now. Yeah. <laughs> I've proven I can actually make something. <laughs> so, uh, last question. If you had to, to do it all over again, um, what would you do differently? Hmm. Uh, have more time in a shop. Is that? <laughs> I don't know how I would do that. I would, I would, uh, I would know now that my initial gears to my minute hand don't make any difference, mm-hmm. and that, and then I would probably make them more decorative or weird, just mm-hmm. to make it look more complicated, <laughs> <laughs> make you feel smarter somehow. A little more Rube Goldbergish. Yeah, yeah. But other than that, I couldn't really do a whole lot differently. You know. So what if we had more time? I had more money. I had, say that. If I had a CNC machine, <laughs> well, if I had more time, I'd make it completely different. But if I had just the same amount of time I had, I'd do the same thing I did. Yeah. I'd remember to machine hands. That's what I would do differently. I'd how do how would it have been different if you had more time? I would have made two clocks. I would have made the one I made, and I would have made a larger one that was driven by a chain. Mm. That, was, I, that was my original plan was to have this one and then have a wooden like bike chain driving another one that would be cool yeah so is that is is that the next clock no no my next clock I think is gonna be you ever you remember those like uh, old alarm clocks like in the 70s where they had the numbers that would like flip yeah uh-huh. oh yeah flip clock I want to make one of those that's like five feet by two feet <laughs> cool <laughs> And then have it all geared inside, you know, make the, make the whole mechanism. Dude, you, you know that's how to get yourself on Geekology. Just do anything but do it bigger than anybody has ever done before. Or build it out of something no one would expect. So you should, like, build it out of pencils. <laughs> <laughs> Number <laughs> two, Ticonderoga pencils. Bacon. CNC. <laughs> <laughs> you glue them up and you make, you make sheet goods out of them. There you yeah, go. There you go. So if I had to do mine over again, and I actually have thought about, I may actually change this. Um, I'd make the numbers larger. The numbers were completely just uh, I, real quickly. I, In fact, I brought it along. That is a piece of wood that I cut on my bandsaw. And that, if you trace it and flip it and trace it again, that's a number one. And if you take that, and these are the pieces of two by four that I resawed to do that. All right, so there's a number one right there. And then number five, I just kind of angled that at an angle I thought would be good and traced that and flipped it over and did another. And then there, you know, made, made my uh, my tens by crisscrossing those. After seeing them on that big dial, I, I would go much bigger with the numbers hmm. and because there's just so much real estate there that's not being being covered so I, I've I'm considering prying those puppies off of there and make, making some bigger numbers Fair enough. yeah but probably no no time soon <laughs> again my uh, my my bride has uh, has wanted a, a kitchen table or a dining room table forever. And the table we have right now is one that has a, a stationary center and two leaves that fold down. So when the leaves are down, you can't slide chairs underneath it and yeah. it, it's not very useful, but you can kind of push it against the wall. When the leaves are up, it's too big for the size uh, dining room that we have because the dining room is also her office for the Aristocob business. So she's got her computer and printer and all this stuff that she's working with in that space. So she wants a table and, and one that she would be proud of and that I would be proud of that would fit the space and be more, more functional. And I just, as many times as I've actually started and bought pieces of wood for it and just never gotten it done, um, she's was really thrilled that all month long I was making time to go to the shop <laughs> to build a clock for myself. <laughs> it's just like thrilled? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But the lesson learned is, like you said at the beginning, 
sometimes it doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to get in there and do it. Yeah. That is a stumbling block for this guy quite a bit. Uh, he wants to, uh, doesn't want to do it if it's not yeah, right. I, I, I overly, because it's not going to be right, he chooses not to do it. I overly complicate it to the point where I then can't start. Yeah, I do that. Well, I guess what I need to do is I need to issue someone a throwdown to build a table. I don't know who that is. I don't need a table. Maybe we make. Maybe, maybe I need to make a community wide. Think about throwdown. how easy it would be with your CNC. It's just <laughs> two rectangle. foot by four foot. Because when you start talking about tables, the table I thought of was you ever see this table? It's like round and you can rotate. Yes, <laughs> isn't that amazing? The first table I thought was that was fun to make. And then I'm like, oh god. I don't know. <laughs> can you see and see uh, any metal? Can you do any you like know, uh, aluminum. aluminum or brass? Yeah, soft metals I can do. That would be cool. You could do that. Because yeah. yeah. the, the, the most challenging part of that table is the whole metal <laughs> apparatus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got enough problems. That not <laughs> I have an idea for a table that I want to build. And uh, if I were to commit to a throwdown, that's definitely the one I would build. So my, my, my biggest issue is I'm about to, beginning next week, I've got... Uh, one, two, three, travel four, season. five, I think six straight weeks of travel, yeah. including a couple weeks in Europe. And then I just found out then the whole month of July, I'm going to be traveling as well. So it just, it's just impossible for me to, uh, to be around. Thank goodness. Boy's wife is going to have a C-section and, uh, we know when the next baby's coming and I'm, you know, you can plan around it. Uh, I was supposed to be at a meeting in Dallas the day of her C-section, but I'm going to fly out at 5 p.m. the day of her C-section. Ah. So, yeah, that uh, makes it tough. Yeah. It's actually been moved. You'll have more Don't time. you move. It's, it's been moved earlier. <laughs> it's earlier? been moved to the Thursday before. Right, so right. A few days. Where I don't think I'm going to be around. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you well, so much. I mean, I mean, when you come around... <laughs> He'll be here. So, so you just you know, smear something sticky on him and say, "Hey, yeah, he's that's here." Right. <laughs> that's right. Oh well. Well, Jay, this was a ton of fun to do the throwdown. Thank you for taking the time to, to join us on this uh, this episode. It looks like an extended episode of Markwood Men's Breakfast Club. A, a very special. A very special Markwood Men's Breakfast Club. That's right. You know, they called me special when I started kindergarten. And I never, never could figure out if that was a good thing or a bad thing. I would say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, need I bring up again 24 minute second, second hand? <laughs> I would think the hour hand or the minute hand, one of the two of them would have been the second hand. Yeah. Right? One of them is the first one. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's well, all arbitrary anyways. One of us needs to go back and study horology. <laughs> I, I, f I fear maybe it was well, me. It's more fun just to try to figure it out on the fly. <laughs> By the way, you were going to ask me a question about force versus uh, something. What was it? Oh, about inertia? Inertia. And, I, and, and Once I saw the movement, I then answered that. You're just shifting the center of gravity. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so I, I, I'm, I'm glad that we're going to be able to leave Newton out of the discussion. Yeah. Although he did make some excellent fig cakes. There you go. I have to say that. He's a pretty weird guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All um, right. Who eats figs otherwise? Who eats figs? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think it's anybody does. Italians eat figs. Do they? Oh, God, yeah, it's a big deal. Somebody gives you figs off their fig tree. They really like it. Ooh, I like figs. I like uh, in, in Europe, a breakfast in Germany is amazing. Yeah. And one of my favorite things to discover in, in season is they, they'll do... They'll do figs and fig. Um, uh, I, I guess it would be like a, um, a a jelly, a preserve, or something like that. But it'll be with the cheese, right? So it's 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 a, a cheese platter kind of a deal that they're laying out for you with the figs. What a wonderful combination, cheese and figs. Yeah. Who would have thought? Yeah. Yeah. The Italians, probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, Jay. Thank you for joining us, and 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 for you, number four, number four. Thank you for joining us again uh, and sticking around with us. And uh, we'll uh, see you again next week. Make it a great week, and uh, bye, boy. Bye. <laughs> bye. Dinga dinga.